we are going live. Okay, yes, we are going live. This, yeah. Just waiting for one more panelist to join in. I hope he can join in. Okay. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you. It gives me a great pleasure to be moderating this part of the Horace's 2021 conference. My name is uh, Atul Tabonika. I am the chairman and co-founder of the Global Schools Foundation, a not-for-profit education institution based here in Singapore, which believes in providing quality education to every deserving child around the world. So welcome to all our guests who have joined this panel discussion today, where we will be talking about a very pertinent topic, educating the world's poor. As a founder of an education, it's education foundation, I'm aware of the challenges that many young people face, especially in this time of scarcity. The world's resources are depleting. The earth is warming steadily and the pandemic has caused a major havoc. The most vulnerable section of the society suffering heavily from these crises have been none other than the young children. Statistics before us provide a very stark picture. 265 million children are currently out of school and 22% of them are of primary going age. Globally, 83% of the children complete fifth grade in the school, but only 55% of the students actually finish the high school. And the World Bank estimates that nearly half of the 740 million extreme poor people on this planet live in Asia, and half of those are children. According to UNESCO, if children of all low-income countries develop their reading skills, around 180 million people would escape poverty. If all adults complete secondary education, the global poverty rate will be cut by more than half. Impressive, isn't it? So reaching these vulnerable sessions to provide support is a mammoth task in itself. And gathering students and teaching faculty is the simplest task. But there are many things to consider. Where will the hardware or the mobiles come from? Which learning facilities to be provided? What needs to be used? How to deliver school space and electricity? And most importantly, how to use education as a force of good to bring meaningful change to the world? Welcome, Javed. Many other considerations are also to be taken into account. The safety of the children is paramount as is their nutritional needs. In many regions, school-provided food is one major important pull for the students, especially for the girls to be sent to the schools. The 2020 COVID pandemic put all serious efforts towards educating the world's poorest on a very, very serious back foot. So lockdowns and safe distancing led to temporary closure of schools which impacted around 91% students worldwide. So nearly 1.6 billion children and the youth were out of school by April, 2020. And nearly 369 million children who rely on school meals needed to look at other sources for their daily food nutrition. These are humongous challenges. And never before did so many children be out of school at once, putting their hard earned <clears throat> gains in global education in jeopardy. But all is not lost. In the recently released Sustainable Development Goals, the United Nations named education as its fourth goal, giving it the much needed boost. This is important because education is the only tool which will develop skills, help fight inequality, and decrease vulnerability of these poor sections and help us win this battle. The education crisis is not just about students learning to read and write, but to be able to effectively use the knowledge to change 
their circumstances or their livelihoods. Interpreting information, thinking critically, communicating well, and collaborating with the like-minded people for upliftment of themselves and their communities is very important. Now, many of us are working diligently towards these goals and many more shall join to fight, to join the fight to ensure that education reaches those who need most. Which is why today's discussion is going to be about a very enlightening and a fruitful one, considering the esteemed minds we have on the panel. From India, we have Mr. Arun Ryan, Vice Chairman of Center for Innovation in Education and Empowerment. Welcome, Narayan. From the US and the West Coast, we have Mr. Alec Wong, Founder President of Tana Investment Group, who is joining this panel. And Mr. Kuram Jamil, Co Founder and President of Area 9 Lyceum, Denmark. I welcome you all to this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, maybe request uh, Mr. Alec to put forward his, <laughs> his thoughts and comments. Thank you, Atul. It's great to be here um, among you and my fellow panelists to discuss this very important subject. And you had a great opening and you already covered many of the topics that are worthwhile discussing. Now, as you mentioned, with uh, education being one of the SDGs, ensuring uh, inclusive and uh, equitable access to quality education for all, um, reforms and improvements have already been on many countries' agenda for a while. And we are seeing great progress with increased participation and completion rates across different levels of schooling. But as you also mentioned, there are significant headwinds as well. For example, COVID-19 has wiped out as much as 20 years of uh, educational gains in some parts of the world. And uh, basic school infrastructure are still lacking in many poorer regions. These are all very urgent issues we need to tackle. Um, and when we do look at approaching the issues with education and poverty, we do have to acknowledge that there are larger um, economic and social contexts surrounding the schools. Things um, happen or inequities that lie outside of the campuses, but impact what happens within the classrooms. They also influence the strategies, the prospects and aspirations for the students, as well as their families and educators. Um, so while, while school-based measures are vitally important, like improving teacher quality, strengthening accountability, uh, increasing school numbers, etc. Depending on those measures alone um, to move everyone out of poverty would be too simplistic and it would be insufficient. So we have to look at um, those measures as well as a wider range of different solutions. For example, from the financing standpoint, there, there have always been longstanding discussions and debates about what forms of uh, financial model works best for education and whether privatization would um, exacerbate inequality, for example. And to look into these, I do think it's worthwhile to analyze the return on investment, in this case, return on educational investment across different levels from primary, secondary, um, and higher education, and see how they uh, vary from each other as well as uh, vary across different regions, because these are the uh, factors that would impact or affect uh, the incentives for different funding sources, like government uh, spending, uh, private enterprises, or aid agencies, and definitely with the individuals. So... Um, I'm involved with a couple different educational foundations, and each of them have um, have their specifically different but um, focuses and priorities that help different schools and students along the various stages of their educational path. Um, so if we look at from a different angle, we also have to look at macroeconomics and public policies as well, because while education can 
play an important role in creating meaningful changes and empowering the individuals. Oftentimes, it's the macro policies that determines um, how do individuals escape poverty or if they do at all. For example, how to establish a wage system that would uh, support a certain living standard, how to reach a level of employment for that same purpose, how to direct uh, resources towards issues like health, mental health, uh, food insecurity, Ron mentioned that a little bit earlier when we were chatting privately. And these are all um, matters that would impact educational outcomes um, directly. So for that matter, you know, since uh, the, the, the panel is calling for us to talk about uh, potentially innovative solutions, I do think it's worthwhile looking at the growing popular idea of a universal basic income in different areas or variations of it, uh, which I think could be positive measures towards improving educational outcome as well as uh, alleviating poverty uh, as well. So moreover, there are social factors and uh, gender conventions that play important roles in terms of how people might be able to apply their education towards bettering their lives. There are established inequalities associated with uh, wealth, with land ownership, with social capital and hierarchy, uh, information access, etc. And they often act as, um, uh, as the obstacles against upward mobility. And they often reinforce the class division we uh, already see. So while these are not things are easily um, changed in a fundamental way because they have to do with history, culture, habits, etc. There are many worthwhile actions or goals we can pursue. Um, for example, strengthening the, the technical and vocational training systems uh, as a way to gap certain educational gaps. Or, uh, for example, uh, empowering women, bringing female leaders to positions of power and shrinking the gender gap. Uh, I think those are all very important things. And they all take uh, political commitment and will. They take leadership from different levels of government and society. Um, and we can talk about those as well. And certainly there are many other areas of both problems and solutions like how to utilize technology as a force for good in education, innovative financial vehicles, um, et cetera. And I know my fellow panelists are uh, experts in many of these areas. So I will take a pause here and I look forward to learning uh, more from everyone's input. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Alec. I think uh, you covered broadly a lot of uh, the areas which are very, very relevant to this. Uh, may I now request uh, Mr. R. L. Narayan, joining us from India, to give his uh, line of thoughts and uh, to give his uh, you know, humble ideas about this. Yeah, my pronouns to uh, fellow panelists. And I, I, at the outset, I would like to thank Frank for the opportunity and the kind of dialogues he's having consistently year after year after year. And uh, I find that in democracy, dialogue is the only way to lift ourselves up. That is, I always believe in the concept of rising yourself by yourself. So, uh, an individual lives in a society, and the society is in a country, and the country, the world, the combination of countries form the world. So, an individual is as important as a state and uh, 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 as a society as a whole. So the focus on individual is very, very much important. So in the context, what we are talking, and we had uh, a wonderful opening by Atul, coming out of his experience uh, as an educator himself. Uh, I, I find this, uh, this platform uh, as a wonderful medium to exchange ideas and thoughts across the uh, continents. Uh, and we can pick whatever is best for our country and our particular society from the thought leaders across the world. That's what this platform provides for. And uh, uh, he's bringing the government also into the uh, listening mode. Uh, so uh, it's an opportunity for the government uh, policymakers uh, to listen to the thought leaders across the world to come to the solution. Why I am telling in this context is very much important. So if I have to speak from the context of India, 
So if you look at India, India has been a great country. It has a, a, a past uh, of, uh, you know, history of civilization, history of over 5,000, 6,000 years. Uh, but then what happened? What happened in India in the past in, the, in, this, uh, in this context is very much important. So if you look 300 years before, India was having a GDP of around 20 to 25 percent uh, of the entire world GDP. Uh, and we had schools in around about 600,000 villages. Still, India is uh, a rural oriented country. We are coming out of uh, that. But in that 300 years before, we had 600 schools. Imagine. And there was nothing called poverty. There is no poverty, absolutely. Because food cannot be sold in India. You can, you can trade rice. You can trade all the other commodities. But per se, the cooked food cannot be sold. Because the philosophy behind it was a cooked food. Every organization, uh, every organism in this world, right from ant, it has a right to own the cooked food. You cannot stay hungry. Uh, so every individual, uh, leave the individual, every ant, uh, from ant to the other animals, has the right to the food. So the, what impacts two, two aspects of poverty is one is food. The other aspect is uh, education and knowledge. So we had covered all the, across the village. They had schools, village schools, imparting knowledge, the fundamental foundational knowledge. And we had uh, food across all uh, the villages. So there was nothing called poverty. Then what happened is this, the, the, the colonization happened. And uh, we all know about the effects of that. I don't need to talk about that. And it has brought this country to stage. Even after 70 years, we are still fighting poverty, which is very sad. But uh, uh, as of, I know that the last 10 years, whatever is the governments have taken efforts, is already leading to the, the the fundamental change, and the World Bank has also recognized this. As Atul pointed out, so what we have to do, uh, look into uh, to to this aspect. So as I said, there are multiple aspects in this. One is the the food aspect of it. If I remain if I remain hungry, I cannot know I cannot gain knowledge. So even uh, no amount of uh, pushing by the government will help. So that problem has to be solved. For, I'm talking from the context of India, which can also help the other countries. So what we have done basically is uh, we have worked on multiple layers attacking this. So one, we need to bring prosperity. So that I would say that uh, the one good lesson for the world, the entire world is the white revolution. One billion liters of milk bought by Amul Cooperative Society, the remote corners of uh, Gujarat and uh, that side of that part of India which is again blossomed out to the entire country. So that single-handedly lifted uh, around about 100 to 150 million farmers out of poverty. Uh, the sustained efforts of the government along with the public uh, and the stakeholders, various stakeholders, this uh, cooperative movement has lifted and today it's one of the largest, uh, we, India stands as the largest milk producer. In this process, what has happened is the education has automatically flowered in. Uh, and uh, the way in which this uh, rural empowerment lessons, I can say, which has happened because of this uh, milk revolution uh, from net importer of milk. India is now the world's largest producer of milk, having overtaken U.S. two decades ago. The billion uh, liter idea, which was uh, uh, the white revolution, which was fundamentally given by Sardar Patel, the Iron Man of India, and it was uh, taken by uh, Mr. Korean. Uh, fantastically so what we do now is we have 100 million plus daily farmers more than 70 million of them are just having two three milk animals per head so this cooperative movement has put together given prosperity to the entire uh, uh, rural folk importantly women they have empowered women so once the woman is empowered uh, I feel that uh, the family immediately starts to come out of poverty. So this is one key thing. And most importantly, with this, regarding to this education, what I would like to say is there was a rural development institute which was started uh, to develop the managers who can manage these uh, villages. So this essentially what happened uh, uh, because of this rural development institute was the, the, the institute was able to develop 3,000 managers over a period of time. And these, out of these 3,000 managers, few went on to start the largest uh, corporate I ITC e Chopal, which is empowering millions of farmers again. Uh, and various government bodies are headed by the managers coming out of this institute. So this has helped uh, to uh, eradicate poverty and bring prosperity to the, to the uh, rural India in a big way. And coming back to the school education, what we can do, uh, the, the context which I'm saying now is we need to consider this as an ecosystem, the villages, the people who are in poverty and how to lift them out of poverty through education. 
So if you look at it in a holistic way, they need to go into a little bit of prosperity to look into the education itself. Otherwise, they will put their child to work. They, they, don't, they can't afford to put their child to education. So what the government has also done is they are giving a, a, a meal plan, as Atul pointed out exactly, that uh, the government has planned that and uh, around about uh, uh, 100 million kids currently. Uh, get these uh, meals. They, the government is giving 700 calories of hot cooked meals every day. They give one meal every day and the government is giving uh, a complete subsidy of this. Central government and state government share subsidies and it is going to reach and this further is going to develop. And second thing, this is one important thing to bring these rural children into these schools. Now we have rural poor and urban poor and the government is working on a great mechanism to again lift this out of this poverty. The second thing which I want to tell uh, is uh, the most important thing is the way the technology is being used uh, in India especially to transfer the people out of poverty on one thing yes we have to start rural development work we have to start schools in the rural areas we have to make children come to the schools and one important way of coming to the making the children come to the school is food uh, you give them the good food hard cooked food they, 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 they come to the school for the purpose of eating. They can't remain hungry. So this is one important thing which the government has successfully done. And the, But the problem still the government faces is in the functional learning. Not only India, there are various other countries which are working in this. Uh, 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 the foundational learning aspect is, uh, is uh, Kenya is working on it. South Africa is working on it. Brazil is working on it through their various approaches. The, the foundational learning, because 54 to 55 percent of the P students who are joining the schools, they are not able to read. They are not able to read the numbers. The World Bank in 2018 came out with a report on this foundational learning. And they found that even Kuwait and uh, some of the Middle East countries are still remaining in the same, uh, same bracket. So we need to attack that. We need to work on this foundational learning. If we get that aspect are clear, that is within standard one to three, which is major, uh, the, the government uh, has to put that clear effort in it. And they are putting effort in Anganwadis and reaching out to the villages. So the villages, it, it has to come from the village level. To village level, if this, the foundational learning is happening, I would be saying that they're working on the first step of attacking the poverty. This is a step number one. But without step one, we can't go to number two. If the basement is not right, we can't work on the uh, pillars. So the basement has to be intact. So the foundational learning, and it has been accepted across the world that the foundational learning is a key step to in the eradication of poverty. This is the first step. So one that is done. We can talk about the multiple steps at various levels of attacking the poverty so that the education and knowledge transfer can happen even at the age of 15 or 16 or 20 or 25, so which will help them. That is what the government of India is doing now. The another technological revolution, which I would say is about the ADA, which uh, billion uh, identification cards given in, in, a, in, in a span of decade. And Indian Institute of Management, which is uh, a premium institute ranked along with the uh, Thing of Harvard and MIT, uh, they have come out with the top 10 innovations in this decade and they've ranked Aadhaar Adha, as one of the important innovations happening from India, which is again a lesson to the world, a billion uh, uh, ID cards given in a matter of 10, uh, 10 years at a cost of a uh, dollar or so uh, to individuals for transfer using this uh, Aadhaar, they're transferring the uh, cash directly to the uh, 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 respective stakeholders who are major uh, poor people living in the society. They have bank accounts. And the government, uh, this new government, whatever they they done with this opening of the Janadar banks, where 400 million accounts have been opened to poor people who did not have bank account for the last 300 years or 500 years. They did not have bank account. They don't, they don't even have an identity to go and seek out of the village. If the village is sinking and they have to move out of the village, they don't even have an identity card. So how can they run a family? So government, at the first step, they gave an identity card so that they can go and stake the work. It, through something, some effort, they can come out of poverty. This is a this is a kind of empowering them. After empowering them, they they opened bank accounts because with the help of this. And once the bank account got opened, 43, 4, 400 million accounts. It's not small. It's 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 a big number. And World Bank has again appreciated and recognized this fact. And the direct transfers are happening to them. One way the government is giving children the food they require. Other area they are allowing this functional, uh, this foundational learning is happening. They are attacking poverty simultaneously. So this is a coordinated effort of the government, of the NGOs, 
of the uh, village panchayats so we, the, the the entire society should work cohesively if we need to make the other people lift out of poverty and my suggestion is in this forum i would like to say that the the, the corporates through the corporate social responsibility should also come forward to join hands we can't make everyone wealthy but we can make everyone prosperous so the the the, the wealthy people because i'm also advising the wealth, wealthy people they have to come forward to take participate along with the government to to make this a very big movement it's a problem and we need to attack this and we we are making a good beginning here that thank is you, thank you thank yeah. you thank you narayan i think uh you could have could not have been more comprehensive than uh what you've just mentioned in in the very very short address that you made uh covering all aspects of what the governments could do to alleviate the poverty we'll come back to you a couple of very interesting points in that and we'll come back to you after uh let me invite now our colleague jamil kurum uh from denmark <coughs> and jamil happens to be an educator and so it will be interesting to see what jamil brings different perspectives to this conversation what do you jamil thank you <clears throat> so um it's um this this very complex task is uh, you need to of course and i am very humble uh, around uh, coming with any uh, good ideas right because it's uh, it's complex as as uh, narayan and alec also mentioned but i think uh, what you're all saying and what i'm hearing is uh, also alec you mentioned the sdg goals if we don't fix uh, One, two, three. We can get to the uh, goal four of quality education, and I think <clears throat> that's maybe what we can discuss. So it becomes more discussion because I can't myself uh, isolated uh, bring a good idea. But uh, but how do you actually link those uh, uh, those uh, no hunger, uh, uh, no poor, and, and good health? to education i think uh, you're right narayan that uh, you need the first before you can go to the fourth level the quality education but could you uh, and i do have an input there uh, do something where you um, where you join uh, the instruments uh, food instruments financial instruments to uh, good education um so um i'm i am an educator myself as you mentioned uh, atul and a medical doctor by training but the last 20 years uh, been building um, learning technology platforms and our platforms have to date uh, reached around uh, 40 to 50 million uh, learners uh, but uh, personally the thing that i'm most uh, passionate about is uh, how can we solve this uh, challenge of getting more people out of poverty uh, through education and it's a, it's a complex task and that's some of the things that <clears throat> i myself I uh, also am trying to focus on the next uh, next many years. One of the projects we've been involved in 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 a rich country like Denmark. So we, I have to say this is a experience from Denmark that as Nayan you mentioned uh, we may learn from what people are doing in one country into uh, other countries. So what we did was we looked at uh, some of the research that we've seen in the US in school districts how do you through education and pocket money so a financial instrument of pocket money reduce uh, uh, crime rate amongst the uh, kids in the uh, disenfranchised uh, areas and uh, some of the research uh, or the research shows that uh, you can motivate um, kids to to take and do education if they if they also have a kind of financial gain from doing it so what we did was together with some uh, actually the largest social housing organization in Denmark uh, we Uh, embarked on a on a courageous math project the, so the platform is called courageous math and uh, you make a contract with the kids parents uh, so it's targeted at 6 to 9th grade kids uh, in uh, in these social housing areas and uh, so it's a supplement to the school uh, where you basically through an app uh, can do math and for every module you complete you get uh, 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 some pocket money and um, this has been a huge success and have now spread to many more uh, social housing areas so the question uh, and it will be discussed a little bit uh, as a prep call to this can you use some of those whether it's our platform or many of the other good edtech platforms that are out there now can you use those technologies those good learning technologies that are coming out or are out and tied with 
let's say, uh, a food program, uh, whether it's the milk program uh, or financial instruments, working with foundations. So companies like corporations like my own works with foundations or governments, social housing areas or housing areas, um, and, and, and try to do something similar. What, what would be the... I would be interested, uh, especially from you, Narayan, uh, to hear what would be the obstacles, let's say, in, in India to do something like this, where you actually have a platform with foundational knowledge, reading and writing and math. That's what we need to teach as a basic. So we have that. My company has it. Many other companies probably also has it. We have a will to also do something with that, but we lack kind of... Um, the food tool and, and uh, people to go out and, 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 and implement it and maybe some financial instrument to support um, kids and parents to be motivated because you can motivate. That's the other big problem. Someone that is poor uh, and hungry, right? So how can you, with, with, the, with the collective power of partnerships, how would you uh, do that, uh, for example, or is that happening right now? Maybe some, uh, let's say, in India, uh, to you, Narayan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this is happening. It's wonderful uh, to uh, know from you, uh, 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 Jamil, that uh, as you rightly said, that collaboration is the key word in the 21st century. Uh, when I went to Germany as an ambassador from India, I found that uh, uh, Benz and BMW collaborating. Mm. These are two competitors, but they are collaborating for the strength of the country to yeah. make the country prosperous. So mm -hmm. uh, I always believe that knowledge is borrowed. You do, knowledge does not belong to you. It is borrowed. You borrowed it from somebody, your teachers. You are a kid. You have to borrow knowledge from uh, the society, right? And my fundamental question is, what is education? Now let us question, what is education? What, what you gain from education? Mm. Uh, the answer is you gain knowledge, right? Education and learning, you gain knowledge. And with knowledge, what you do? Knowledge, you apply to work, you gain you know, prosperity, you do so many things. So the knowledge, you have to do education and learning. Not learning becomes knowledge. And the knowledge becomes then wisdom. Which, When it becomes wisdom, as you rightly said, it, it, the entire society benefits of the wisdom. Mm. And it doesn't stop the Indian traditional philosophy. It doesn't stop there. It says that the wisdom has to become a discipline. You need to be disciplined. Uh, and you need to build your character. Uh, to for further to evolve the human being to evolve and the wisdom evolves it becomes love okay and in love you think of the entire world you think of the entire planet then that's what comes the climate everything comes into that space now uh, you sitting in Denmark can affect a billion people in India right that is what you're telling your thought can affect the billion people in India and that's what happened. I would say that the, the, if you take Mahatma Gandhi, if you take Martin, Martin Luther King, if you take Mother Teresa, these are all individuals, you know, uh, but their thought affected the entire world, entire civilization. So that's what I would say that if you if you if your thought is there, yes, there, there are people working on that. But as I said, that it is it is the, the gestalt psychology says that it is the whole is always different from the sum of the part. The sum of the part doesn't mean the whole. So we need to think holistically. So we need to think in the ants. The first thing is food. In fact, one of the freedom fighters 70 years before from this part, the same place where I'm sitting, he said that if single individual in the world does not have food to eat, he has a right to destroy the entire world. Hmm. He said that it's a poem. It's a freedom fighter. Uh, it was more socialist than the entire Russia. Even the like, communist and Karl Marx cannot uh, could not have any such this uh, kind of thought. So hmm. food is very, very important. Uh, only a poor person can say that how food impacts him. Right. Three days, five days, months together, if he's without food, he cannot think anything else. His mind is stunted. And uh, we have found one, through one of our research, because I'm working in the rural India directly, uh, I find that one of the nutritional programs, because of this, uh, as I said, that this foundational learning, people, because of the lack of nutrition, they get stunted. Once the stunting happens, no amount of knowledge goes into his brain. The brain becomes, uh, uh, it, 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 it yeah, doesn't yeah. erase the optimum thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the nutrition part and the food part is very vital. So what we are doing right now in India, we are doing the same thing that uh, we are attacking the food as a society everywhere so less than one cent less than one cent every individual in this country uh, can uh, get uh, hot cooked meals of 1200 to 1500 calories in a day at less than one cent it is available uh, the government is making it available almost 15 out of uh, the states or 16 states have this implemented this program now uh, uh, then particularly to the children they need food 
if the poor poor seriously require high high quality meal high quality nutrition so government is giving 700 calories of food to meal as i said that and uh, this is going to impact 100 million kids and more people are going to join this program but as uh, particularly to answer your question so if you give we need to cohesively take governments on board then we have to work with the panchayat respective panchayats and villages because india has around as i said that 6 lakh 30 6 lakh 50 thousand villages so we need to work at the village level so we need to empower uh, bring the empowerment in the village level and we need to also think prosperity for the villages we cannot leave the villages prosperity alone and think about the education of the kid and then 30 years later the kid will bring prosperity to the family uh, in the meantime the family will die or what so mm. this question we need to attack and think holistically we need to provide holistic solution that is why i said that the government whatever they have done before the green revolution india has surplus grains and recently we have we have donating 50000 tons of wheat to afghanistan right which is which is major thing and uh, i'd like to say this this is a platform afghan is a country which attacked us for 1000 years mm-hmm. right that is a civilization which attacked us and we are giving donating free of cost 50000 it's not small 50000 tons of wheat is going uh, from india to afghanistan and pakistan blocked the borders but we reopened it uh, to take it to the road that is important step so we uh, we have to think about the global uh, global so- 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 uh, solution we can't isolate uh, a particular part of the world and say that that is their problem or this pro- it is this country's problem as so rightly same said like the is- climate issue right you can the the carbon emissions they travel across borders and poverty uh, i think we need to look at it the same way that, exactly uh, exactly so to answer your question i would say that in one line we need to work collectively hmm. A- alec i would be interested you as an investor how do you look at uh, i mean now we did it as a company as a partly pro bono project in denmark where we actually created the 6th to 9th grade math curriculum and then uh, there was some foundation that gave the pocket money we didn't give the pocket money and the social housing said here are the kids in the, sure. so there was like three elements that were together but it's not been thought through as a roe return on in, uh, on education or investment right. if you as an investor looked at doing something in any country how would you potentially structure where food and money and education and knowledge could be kind of have you seen any Yeah, I think uh is there a company is trying to do that. Link in yeah, the discussion uh you're having is uh there are several things I can really resonate with. Um mm-hmm. the food insecurity, how to address that, housing, I wrote it down. And definitely a key point which is a coordinated effort between the government, the private parties which as you were saying from the investor's point of view, how mm-hmm. what can we Uh, what do we look at for a technology provider or a startup? It really has to do with um, incentives of the different parties. Um, mm-hmm. When you look at the return on education across the board, it seems like um, return on education for primary schools are lower than that of secondary and higher education. So um, a private a private entity when they come in, whether as a technology provider creating a tool. Or a financial provider, for example, making loans. Uh, naturally, um, a for-profit entity would want to tackle what has the higher return. So, and that really necessitate. Um, and since the the primary education has a slightly lower ROE, um, it's less attractive to many for-profit uh, players. And that really necessitates a uh, state effort to come in and cover. And luckily, you know, private education is more universalized and it has more funding from the state. Um, but uh, to answer that question, I think it's a great com- It has to be a combination. For example, I've advised one company uh, who, who whose goal is to use renewable energy, solar, uh, so, uh, specifically solar, and the transportation containers to mm-hmm. use, to make them into portable food banks, basically. They can be self-sustaining, drop to any uh, location without any building infrastructure, et cetera, and work with food distribution uh, or donors or distribution companies to uh, tackle food uh, hunger that way. If it's a poor area with uh, little food, if they can structure... Um, putting the 
the solar power cooling stations there uh, with uh, food distribution companies or donors uh, supplying the food, they can su- supply a community with uh, um, some amount of food and address a uh, hunger issue that way. And through that process, I also uh, learned from food banks or larger established um, uh, food bank type of nonprofits. And I definitely see um, what you were talking about, that hunger is, in fact, a big uh, deterrent in terms of uh, achieving anything else, uh, uh, studying or or work, etc. So we also... Uh, from a technology and investment point of view, we also have investments ourselves towards uh, companies that are addressing housing issue. Uh, to why we, during our conversation, I connected a company uh, with with you, and uh, mm-hmm. I'd love to learn later about if there's anything interesting coming out of it. But uh, mm-hmm. companies that are looking to deliver housing in a more affordable, sustainable, and with the climate issue as well, greener uh, ways, and they can be applied both into school facilities or housing or um, social housing, these type of projects. So technologies are definitely a big player uh, to make some of these goals more achievable. Uh, But to a larger degree, a company uh, has limited resources and they cannot replace the effort that's necessary from the government. So uh, one of the nonprofits we're involved in build uh, or fund the building of schools and accessory facilities like cafeterias or or uh, medical buildings around the schools, etc. And one of the conditions is that they don't come in to fund the whole thing. They always mm-hmm. work with the government to fund a portion of it while having the, uh, the government, local governments accountable and coming up or raising a certain amount of money to achieve these projects together. So... Um, we try to uh, achieve these projects in a coordinated way. I think that's the key and that's important. Yeah. Great. I think we have, uh, we've had some very, very valuable views from everyone. And uh, we, we are actually running out of time, but I think that this is under digital, we can still take uh, you know, one or two questions uh, for each of us. And uh, I would like to just add to what uh, ideas you've given is that uh, there is generally no shortage of frameworks of education that are required to educate the poor. I think there are plenty of frameworks available, plenty of governments know what to do. I think where challenge really comes in is in the execution part of it. And uh, one, of the, one of the experiments that we did for about 10 years is to actually create a, a school with the same curriculum like, uh, you know, which is used by any other students in the cities. And the school was actually created in the uh, forest area or tribal areas. And for 12 years, we ran the school with the same curriculum, same set of teachers, or slightly different teachers. And then we were able to create some of the statistics that we discussed earlier in terms of dropouts, et cetera, completely disappeared. Now, one could be saying is that, you know, what were the financial incentives offered to them? for the students, but technically there were no financial incentives. It was just a matter of putting in the right set of teachers to make sure the right execution happens and to also allow uh, a greater collaboration between the students and the authorities to to further their interests. So for example, uh, you know, in India, in the rural areas, agriculture is very common. So we said, why can't we create something which is provide an agriculture environment within the school, right? The government was very keen. They, they provided it. It was then under the chief minister, Narendra Modi, when he was chief minister of that particular state. And he said, yes, I said, this is a great idea. We'll do it. Now, the sticker or the glue there we found was the agriculture. But mm-hmm. the kids who did not want to offend their parents by saying that I want to be only a, a sort of an educated person, but they also were able to fulfill their parents' wishes by providing and participating in agriculture, by growing produce, by consuming it, and really making sure that that became a role model school. So I think the the part of the problem lies not in the solution, but at the execution, which itself becomes a problem. And so let me let me go over to Alec. You you mentioned a couple of important points: you know, lack of infrastructure, uh, teacher quality issues, macroeconomics, and uh, 
And then you talked about return of return on uh, the education investment. Well, I think it it kind of varies from country to country and city to city to city. Definitely. We've seen the return on primary education is far better than return on secondary or higher education. And the simple reason is the the costs in delivering the higher education are far higher compared to the primary education. So that really changes it, but it all depends on you know whether it's San Francisco or New Delhi or you know somewhere in Denmark. But the question to you, I would want to ask you is, you know, how can really uh, the vocational skills gap narrowing can play a role in your way uh, to to uh, to go to you know educate the poor? Um. Yeah, vocational training. Uh, oftentimes, it well, first of all, it is very much uh, true what you are saying. The return on education differs between uh, different areas. So, if you look at a, a, a suburban area in China versus a rural area in India, it is it's quite different. And uh, um, oftentimes, uh, primary education has a slightly lower. Uh, return on education, what I, what I mean is when somebody completes only primary education and drops out, uh, drops out of school, their return for themselves as well as to society is slightly lower than those who have completely higher um, education. So um, depending on the economic composition of the areas we're looking at, vocational training and the technical training could be a pathway for somebody to reach a position within the labor force that can give them access to a higher income uh, than what they would get otherwise. And, um, and of course, that depends on the area as well. And we do observe that poverty itself oftentimes is the reason that people cannot take advantage of as much benefit as uh, somebody that's better off uh, could. So that's definitely, well, again, a chicken and egg factor. It, it, uh, alleviate poverty, improve education. They go really ha- hand on hand. And uh, in many places also, vocational training and technical training has uh, 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 not as a prestigious of a reputation as if you are going to university, for example. So because of that, um, in, in many ways, they lack the political support or the reputation or the financial support. So, um, yeah, those are all the factors that affect it. And uh, I, but I do think for a certain population, it, it's a pathway to achieving higher income. Great, thank you so much, Alec. Uh, so, Dr. Jamil, uh, thank you. I didn't know you were a medical doctor, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, it's interesting to see how you have used your knowledge in health uh, for the purpose of you know creating this wonderful platform that you have. And, and you also talked about collective partnerships and, and frankly, the experiment that you tried out in the in Denmark with the incentivization, right? In, in, can, can you explain a little bit more in detail in terms of how was it beneficial and were there any shortcomings in that particular program? And is it something that one can sustain over a few years, you know, to a larger population like India, China, uh, mm. you know, because financial incentives would be limited. Yes. Mm. See, it, we would not have been able to do it without the uh, kind of the social housing uh, organization. The, actually, the financial instrument part of giving uh, the pocket money, we, we have even done this in certain uh, councils without the pocket money, is my knowledge, because that was a foundation that needed to give that money. So you can actually do this with, uh, with, the, uh, with the people who um, who take care of Kind of um, some of the kids in the in the social housing areas. So really, what we you you mentioned it yourself at all. It, it's the implementation person in that housing area, and I think uh, to scale that you could work with a volunteer organization that that work in areas where where there's a lot of poor people in more or less what, whatever country to uh, to to implement this. I mean, you do need uh, a. a uh, some kind of a device, either a, a phone, because you can do it on the phone, and you would need uh, some form of a uh, low band uh, with internet, right? So that's another thing that infrastructure has needed to do these things. Um, 
And to uh, Narayan's point, um, I mean, you could do it in, let's say, villages where you have um, someone who is a kind of a village coordinator. Um, it was a, that kind of a person that we had to identify. But those persons were given by the social housing organization. There's around uh, close to a million people in uh, in Denmark living in those. So this is the biggest social housing organization. Um, so I think it, it it's something that can be transported to other countries and scale, uh, and that we are I'm working on looking for projects uh, of this nature in Brazil, in India, uh, and uh, and other uh, countries as well. Uh, but but you need a foundation as a partner, I believe, and you would need something equivalent to uh, uh, what's called social housing here in Denmark. And you will have equivalents of that both in India and, and in, in China, for example. So, uh. Excellent, excellent. Uh, you know, let's move to uh, other area, which is, uh, you know, Narayan talked about the cooperatives. And uh, mm. I can share with you that in the, in the policy side, uh, we've given a lot of input since 2015 uh, mm -hmm. to some of the local governments, whether it's, uh, in, in Singapore or Malaysia or India. And, and, uh, recently India changes uh, implemented, uh, a new education framework called NEP 2020, which saw a fundamental change in many, many ways in which the entire education is structured. Uh, so as to, I mean, just to give a quick idea, uh, you used to have the kindergarten from nursery to grade two, uh, K2, and then you had grade one to grade six, and then you had grade seven to, you know, grade 12 or something like that. So they actually combined the nursery and the mm -hmm. kindergarten with the grade one and two to create the foundation stage. Uh, and, and then there were some other changes. But what's more mm -hmm. interesting is one of the suggestions we had given uh, late 2015 was about implementing standards. You know, how do you really gauge mm -hmm. your education is really delivering what you want and how can you measure them? And that's been included in this year uh, NEP uh, implementation. But coming to you, uh, Ryan, you, you brought in a very interesting uh, comparison about the cooperatives and the power of cooperatives, right? We've seen that in the financial sector. We've seen that in the, the milk sector, uh, which is done by this private federative uh, federation. Do you think cooperatives can be a channel to really get education or the world's poor educated? Any role for them? See, as I said, uh, to, to answer the question, even what Jamil put to, uh, together uh, in the first phase, I said that, see, if you look at uh, India as a whole, uh, now we have around about 1.2 million schools approximately. In the 1.2 million schools, in each and every village, there is a cooked meal delivered. It's a function. See, the way government machineries can work, no foundation, no individual can work like that. One, as, he, as Atul pointed out in the program, execution is the key. In the last 70 years, we have mastered that. The execution part has been mastered. Now, uh, technology cannot help in, in, in uh, reading to learn. The question, as I said, that is the most important is foundational learning. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Jamil was also pointing out, Brazil is attacking it, Kenya is attacking it. So every country is attacking it. So once that is cleared, now, then so much thing can happen through technology because India is having 600 million phone smartphones are coming. And I would say that uh, in, in the next three, four years, I would say that uh, we can attack, uh, bring technology and lift people out of poverty. Because now the educational company, the, the companies, the corporate companies, including Apple and Google, are coming out with the formula that they don't need college education. If you are a good coder, if I can teach a kid coding, I have experimented with this my own school with 5,000 children. And I've got artificial intelligence, machine learning at the standard 7, standard 8 level. That is at the age of 10, 12, 13, when Bill Gates started learning. I give them these uh, tools, They're free of cost. There's no cost to it. So I experimented this. This went very well. And I bought a professor from IIT to teach this kid. Uh, IIT is equivalent of MIT and Oxford. So one professor coming just to teach these village children. Imagine. Mm -hmm live and the, the kind of impact it can have and uh, so it had impact that's what i'm telling and this can lift people out of poverty this can as as a society as i said that if you attack the society as a whole as Atul was also pointing out rightly by bringing agriculture or bringing other allied activities so in that context if i bring this cooperative movement people there had milching cows that's said that they have just two cows with two cows what you can do 
uh, you can't do much. But then, then the entire village comes into play. Then it becomes two thousand, three thousand crores. Suddenly, it becomes ten thousand crores. So the cooperative movement, the power of cooperative movement in built revolution in India, it, it's a lesson to the entire world now. Billions of formal uh, people coming to prosperity. They are, they are, they have been removed completely from uh, for eternity. They have been removed from poverty. So this is the impact which cooperatives can bring. Once the village becomes prosperous, they bring the best of the teachers. They support the government efforts. They take care of the schools. They get the ownership. They move to the next level. They get into the ownership. They get into a movement. See, that's what I would say that in the business for profit activity which I am doing, adv I am advising as I said that the, the HNIs, the pension funds, the ultra HNIs. So if I have to take a lesson from that, a leaf out of that, if I have to understand and study businesses. What I do is the business, you know, some businesses do very well, some businesses fail. But what I've understood is businesses may fail, movements do not. Cooperative is a movement. Apple is a movement. Apple became a movement. When it became a movement, the company became a trillion dollar. Google became a movement. So these are the companies which we Netflix, we, we you know Amazon Prime. It's a movement. So the, 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 this is a stage for the corporate also. So Amul became a movement. The cooperative uh, thing which I started is now again the same thing. The cooperative, if we are able to bring prosperity into the village, uh, automatically the poverty is removed. The education automatically comes into play. But if we can't see education as one one key thing, as Jamil is also pointing out. Uh, uh, I would say that Atul pointed out and Alec also said the same thing. We need to think as a problem, as a holistic problem for the entire society, how to lift poverty at every stage to the children, through education and at, at the second, secondary stage with coding, with other skills where the work itself is changing. So as Atul was asking the question of vocational training, now the robots are going to take over the machines. So we need to bring in the next generation skills into the children into the kids at the right age. If we are able to do it collectively, I think that soon, the next 10 years, at least I could say that India can come significantly out of poverty at 98, 99%, uh, we can come out of poverty. Out of the important statistics, which I would say that 99% of the Indian uh, children are enjoying, the, the poor children are enjoying the rural being program. Now we have a significant improvement in attendance, significant, significant improvement in quality. These things are happening. And one more question Jamil asked, I wanted to bring into this contest before the program ends is, see, Nandan Nilkeni, who he developed this program of Aadhaar card, he was a man behind this Aadhaar moment, where 16% of the world uh, population has been given identification single-handedly. So he bought, because he's a technology guy, he's a uh, chairman presently for Infos, which is one of the largest exporter of Indian uh, software company. Uh, he bought the education formula through technology free of cost to all schools. The entire program is runs free of cost and it had a great impact during COVID. So anybody, any school can download that program through the mobile or through the software, through the laptops. It can be given, it can be delivered. In fact, the government started adopting it. It is one of the biggest movement, I can say, in the education era post-COVID, during the COVID, pre-COVID and post-COVID. This has impacted education in a big way. A school has started using it. It's a free of cost. It is given free of cost. He, he is putting all his money into this, this program because it has got, and I personally had a conversation with his wife, Rosh, uh, 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 Nelkeni. Mrs. Nelkeni, I had a personal conversation. She said that Nelkeni put this money behind this program, seeing the kind of impact it can make. It has made a massive impact. So the private people can also contribute uh, with a purpose if they, they can identify with such a cause. But always, as I said, that execution is important and nothing, nobody can match government, the effective governments in this delivering and removal of poverty. So we need right political stakeholders in this. We need to bring other NGOs, all other things, helping the government bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Narayan. That was very, very eloquently put out. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of uh, time now, but uh, nevertheless, I would uh, want to wrap up the session, say that, look, I think all our efforts, what we discussed today and what ideas we will implement in our domains are going to not only help the children to learn to read and write, but also to be able to effectively use that knowledge. And as uh, Narayan put out, knowledge leads to wisdom, wisdom leads to love. I think that's what our journey, we want to go, let them go through. And, uh, and to help them to change their lives. So we thank you, each of you, Alec, uh, Jamil, and Aril, for participating in this discussion. I'm sure our discussion today will inspire 
a few people and and we will be able to uh, go into our journeys to take this uh, you know very important task at our hand so thank you so much for participating thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alec and happy thanksgiving thank alec you.